of a foreign domain. So our idea was that because optical eyeglasses, sunglasses is a very personal thing, you know, customers will prefer to buy from a local merchant. So we really wanted to present a local shopping experience on a local domain with local guarantee. So the way you did that, what does local mean? Is it just the domain name or did you change the language? Because as far as I know, Australians speak different English to English people <laughs> and New Zealanders. Um, yeah, I'm not making a joke out of it, it's true though. It's a bit like, you know, Hong Kong Chinese, I don't mean spoken, but written and Taiwanese Chinese, different, right? You're exactly right. Like, you know, a Chinese person in Manchester speaks completely different Cantonese. You know. <laughs> That's British and yeah, British yeah, yeah, yeah. As opposed to Apple Daily Cantonese, which you look at. So, if you, you know, like, developing, localizing, localizing for any product or any, any product category to a customer base, you know, it takes time, you know, step by step. So, you know, when you set up a website at the beginning, another English website, it's obviously more efficient at the beginning just to copy the content across. But then we understand Google's search algorithms, we realize that, like, duplication rules, if you have the same content, Google penalizes you, actually. You need to have different content so that, like, Google will recognize... If you say Google is smart enough that they'll look at the description of a product, and they'll go, uh uh, same one, New Zealand, London, or UK. Sure, sure. Right, ditch that one. Sure, I mean, I think that some of the SEO experts here would be able to know this uh, better than me. Who's an that... SEO expert in this room apart from Max? Huh? No, any other SEO expert? The topic's uh, de duplication, no. or duplication of content. Okay. And um, the answer is that Google um, penalizes duplicated content. So if you have the same content, replicated on a blog or on a page or somewhere else, then like Google will see that the content's the same and then not reward those pages as highly as if the content on all the pages is different. Okay, so you start going English in other English speaking countries. And then when does that flip to, what, when, when did you become non-English? What was the first country that was out of the Anglophone? To be honest, um, I, I can't remember, it was one of the European languages, but um, it was because I, I, I'd been you know, educated in Europe, I was comfortable with Europe and the European demo demography, and at the end of the day, once you start developing, developing a global business and chasing different countries, then you start realizing, okay, each country is a different market, and in each market there's a different set of conditions, right? So, and why I say like conditions is like the competitor landscape. Who are the competitors? What are the price points? What is the service offering? And the simple fact is that in today's world, there's a lot of arbitrage opportunities that still exist across Asia, across Europe, um, in these different markets. But how, I don't understand how you had, so you had different prices in different markets? Because I can see between, you know, UK, Australia. But it must be a nightmare to manage all these different prices and all these different markets. How do you get around that? Certainly, like at the beginning, obviously, like let's say we, we started our UK website that was in pounds. Okay, so then you've got to put it like in the database. You need to put a currency multiplier, um, and you can change the currency. So at the beginning, and still today, our website's quite restricted in that there's a currency multiplier. So that if you want to set the price in the UK, it's like a multiplier from the base currency, which is what the product's loaded in, which is at euros at the moment. Um, no but, bitcoins. But you know, again, <laughs> I need to know right? but again this, is a, this is a learning. This, this is the whole attitude of like entrepreneurial business is like the learning that comes with um, understanding. Okay, so we're selling now in the UK in pounds, but like you know, the system only limited us to be able to sell in pounds, which is a multiplier of the euro. And then we realised that we needed to start adjusting certain brands so that we could be more competitive for certain brands. Ray-Ban needed a slightly different multiplier to Tom Ford, so on and so forth. So, so how, so okay, so at what stage, so then you start having multiple languages things. How do you, at what stage do you introduce customer service? Oh, you didn't care, you were just telling no, me. The idea service. of customer service, I don't care, I'm making money. No, customer service is incredibly important from the very beginning because we all know that, you know, like the review mechanism online is, is ruthless and you know if you start disappointing customers if you don't deliver a good you know you're just going to get slammed online with but did you offer company. people the chance to review products on your site or was it purely transactional you know it's stage by stage in terms of the development you know the, the first stage the review feature on the site wasn't wasn't there um, it, it's more about but the customers could obviously provide a review on independent site there's so many independent sites out there that's where you get slammed you know um, 
and if you start getting a negative reputation because customers are writing negative comments on these reviews, then what happens is those review websites start ranking in the search results higher than your website, okay? And that's the worst thing ever. Um, so do you have teams of people going out there and uh, posting nice reviews? No, no, rather... Did you do what the Chinese call uh, guan shui? Yeah, review baiting. Uh, uh, astro surfing. Uh, they're really... The review baiting, yeah, review baiting is a better term. The review sites are, are like, you know, they, they're, they're, they're familiar with this, they check the IP addresses and all this okay. sort of stuff. You, you want to do it, you've got to be very um, smart about it. Um, but um, it's a much smarter thing to do than to, to identify who are your happy customers and to send them an email requesting them to post a review on the site, you know, in exchange for an award or a competition or something like this. Okay. Because, again, so you started engaging your customers. That's right. So out of your out of your sales, how much of it is repeat customers? Right now the the custom the repeat order rate is, is not as high as it should be. Um, because Review. You're not very good at answering with direct numbers, mate. <laughs> How much of your business is repeat customer? 20%? 30%? Yeah, it's, it's different for the different product categories. We sell sunglasses, eyeglasses, and contact lenses. Yeah. Okay? Contact lenses are a repeat order because customers want to continue the delivery of their goods. So you're seeing repeat order rates there, you know, 50% of that yeah. and up and up, you know? So if someone gets it delivered, they're happy to order again the following month. For eyeglasses and sunglasses, it's lower, it's, uh, it's in the teens. So okay, so so you've got you've got you're building a, a rapport with your customers. You've got different languages going on, um, and then is it still called Vision Direct, or do you just have lots of? Do you have to buy different domains? When we um, moved from Vision Direct from Australia to the global, we needed a global name, a global brand. Um, so at, at that point, we came up with the name Smart Buy Glasses. Um, you know, it's a bit gay, I think, in some respects. You know, the name, you know, it's, it's supposed to be simple, you know. Um, you know, a lot It's of, not gay, it's just hard to spell. You know? Is it the by, is it the by, or is it by? Or is it by, which yeah. is kind of, you know, LBF anyway. There's, there's, two, there's two ways to go with a name. You can come up with like a, a, a funky name like Zalora or Amazon or, you know, something like that. A word that means something, you can make up a word. Or you could come up with like a, a boring word that includes the product, right? Okay, so let's go back. So, so you're online. At what point do you start saying, ooh, there's lots of people who are visiting this website with browsers that are like tablets or mobile phones. So uh, when you go, well, maybe we should, you know, make our website a bit more mobile friendly. Or maybe we should, you know, what happens? At what point did you start doing that? The development of multiple sites, you know, that, that was what took us a couple of years. You know, we spent probably... And what technology did you use? Everything's homemade, everything's built, built um, you know, by Chinese programmers. Oh, really? So you can go out and use Magento or... The or it, it's that. great if you want to set up a shop in one country, like a dot com, you know, you use a Shopify or something like this. But the, the minute you start wanting to like localize in different countries and doing a lot of custom things, that's when you start getting a lot of um, uh, platform problems, you know, with the service. So as your advice, if somebody in this room was an e-commerce person and they wanted to build an e-commerce website in other markets, would you say don't buy any of these off the shelf guys? Not, not, at all. Not, not at all, not at all. It's more about the stages of development and the product category and other factors. You know, we also were offering prescription lenses, okay? Which is like, you know, the prescription inside the eyeglasses. And um, that's what you call RX, right? RX, yeah. yeah it's we can see it. Yeah. So, um, prescription. Not your site, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so prescription glasses, okay? So that means that in the purchasing process, it's not just selecting a product and checking out, it's selecting a product and then offering the customer, do you want like the lenses? And then if you want the lenses, how do you choose the lens? You know, the lens purchasing process, the index, the prescription. So you have something quite funky on your website at the moment where you can kind of take a picture of yourself and put glasses on. Has that got a high conversion rate? Or is it just a gimmick? The the 3D trial tool yeah. that the following is referring to, it's like you can try the glasses on in 3, 3D, 3D model, with like three three dimensions. It's got very funky technology. It's like, because in the old technology was you had to load a picture of yourself and then the picture comes up and then the glasses would be on the picture. The new technology is that um, we build 3D models of the sunglasses and then you sit in front of the computer screen and you activate the camera and then your face appears on the screen and then the glasses appear on your face on the screen. 
So okay. it's three. So if you turn your head to the glasses. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you and does that help you sell more? Is the conversion rate higher on that? The conversion rate is higher on people who try on glasses in 3D, but the result is a, is a little bit um, uh, swayed, if you will, because we only build 3D models of the top sellers, right? Because it takes like about two hours of manpower resources to build a 3D model. You've got to take the photography of the different size, you've got to stitch together the model to build this 3D model, right? So obviously we're not going to build 3D models of you know, like 100,000 models. We don't have the time or capacity to do that. We've, we've got about 500, 600 3D models built at the moment. We build 3D models. So let's go back to the mobile thing. So what stage do you go, I must invest in having, you know, a responsive site or, or even an app? What did you, when, what stage did you start seeing enough business coming from mobile phones that you thought, oh, this is interesting? I think that IT development which is my topic here, and IT development on a responsive mobile site. You know, this, this is based on you know the priorities of the IT department, yeah. and, and I'm not actually managing the IT department. Oh, okay. you know, so, but um, but the point is that like there's always a frustration between the IT guys and like everyone else in the business because everyone else wants their IT to be developed faster and better and you know rolled out more effectively and quickly. But obviously, IT guys know that like you know you got to build the project requirements and all these sorts of dry things. Then you've got to code, then you've got to test, you've got to release. So even though we have a, a team of about 30 people now in our IT team in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, um, we've got two main offices in Hong Kong and Shanghai that have together about 160 plus stuff. Um, but in this IT team, it's all about um, priorities, right? At the end of the day, as with any business department, you've got to prioritize the releases. So in our IT department, I don't know, we've got a, you know this front end, this back end, right? the back end of order management systems, you know, all these sorts of systems. The front end, there's a lot of, um, you know, requirements as well. So right now, Napoleon asks, you know, when's the moment you've developed, uh, like, mobile um, sites? We, we need to improve our mobile site dramatically. But unfortunately, right now, the, the IT team is prioritizing conversion optimization improvements above this. Mate, that was the longest answer I've ever had to a question. So, um, it was a good answer, but it was long. And then you would only say good because you did an MBA and you worked in Intel, and everything takes a long time. <laughs> so, correct. correct. So, um, you're, we've spoken about media. You're in the e-commerce business. You started buying keywords. You started, you know, do you buy display ads? I mean, when did you? So, say I give you a hundred thousand US, and you want to drive traffic. Yeah, just say it, right? Mm -hmm. Intel will give you a hundred thousand. They've got. He needs a drink voucher. He needs a drink voucher. Yeah, drink voucher. <laughs> Good heckle. That's why what? <laughs> I need two for the drink. It's from Intel, so you can hold it for about half an hour. Walk over for another half an hour. Pick up the drink. Yeah. Right. So you've got all this media that you could spend on. What? what if, if you're an e-commerce company, what's the best media to spend on to get people to visit your site? Let's take your Vision Direct in Australia, your own site. If I gave 100,000 Aussie, you're like, right, what am I going to do with it? What would you spend that on in order to get high conversions into your site? So you have a choice of search, you know, display, maybe retargeting if you want to do it. I, I don't Social think, media, EDM. I don't think by saying like one thing, like let's say I say CPC here, like it's not like that's a it's, it's a fraudulent answer actually because it's not about like saying one channel let's spend the money. Like as with any retail business, you've got many channels like multi-channel marketing. There's all these channels, right? So the question is, let's say you have five or ten different marketing channels, you know, across all these channels. The problem is, what where are you going to throw that 100k? Well, should can you optimize what one? You know, can you optimize every channel by spending a little bit more in every channel? Um, you know, what's the cost of optimizing each channel? Um, do you want to focus on one channel, or do you want to focus on multiple channels? You know, is the goal to you know more CPC, more keyword driven, or is it more um, social, or is it PR? You know, and then there's different scenarios for different channels, right? All right. Well, let's say we launch a new a new. I don't know. What's that one? 
I can't remember that. The Smith Optics. So the Smith Optics, right. You've got a new brand, you're launching another okay, brand. Yeah, launch a new brand. When you put a, launch a new brand on the site, obviously day one is step one. The easiest thing, you know, start some PPC, some pay-per-click, you know, ad notes, keyword bidding. Right? Around those, the brand. Around those, around those terms. Okay. You know, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer because then you can focus specifically on those terms relating to that product. And then you can already start assessing, okay, keyword spend, you know, to market, demand, supply, so on and so forth. And then do you start, do you believe in social media as a good way to build up this newly launched brand? Would you go out and get, you know, would you start getting nuts on Twitter and Instagram and... I'm going to talk about Australia then. Social media is a wonderful way of like, you know, continuing the relationship with your customers and just, you know, maintaining a nice soft and fuzzy presence in your customer's mindset. But in terms of the correlation between direct sales and um, social media, it's still inconsistent. And it's not, it's not clear at all, you know, it's uh, Okay, so let's say, so this conference we have today, you told me the other day, you're a, you're a pure play online business, but you've decided I want to open shops, like physical things with walls and glass. Why did you decide to do that? Well... Isn't it easier just to do it online? Well, uh, uh, we actually we haven't decided to... We haven't actually um, decided to open stores. Um, I don't know where this um, idea came from the volume. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it could be a good idea, you know? Um, but, in fact, uh, actually, we have a quandary right now, because we have, I mean, in Kennedy Town, we have, like, Two floors. Um, each floor is ten thousand square feet, and one of the floors has this, you know, huge one thousand square foot sort of vestibule area, and it's overlooking the new Kennedy Town NTR station. So it's a perfect spot for a retail store. But the, Make sure yeah. nobody goes there. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, the NTR doesn't work. Wait, okay. it's delayed because they've discovered something that doesn't work. Okay, sure. But at the end of the day, like, um, let's say, the topic of opening a store. Should we open the store, then the money, the spend, the bricks and mortar, the fixed costs, or if you apply that same energy and resources to opening a new website in a country like Russia or Turkey or whatever else, you know, all of a sudden for the same cost or expense, mental expense, you're going to be opening your, your, your business to, you know, another 50 million, another 100, 300 million customers in another market, right? Um, so it's, it's really like... No, but there's a concept of pop-up stores where you might go to a shopping mall, sure and you do a nice store, people come and they fiddle with it. There's a guy today from a conference from Glamour Sales in China. He was saying, I'm doing a deal with a mall where I will have product that people can interact with, they can feel, they can touch it, they can tweet it, they can whatever, but they had to order on my website. The, the, the question is about width or depth in terms of the, um, the business and how you want to grow your business. If you want to go wide, you go into more countries or more products. If you want to go deep, you want to like, penetrate one market really strongly. You want to be able to capture market share in one country. So uh, I certainly agree with the retail strategy then if you want to focus on one country, right? Because like as an online seller in one country, you're only ever going to get, you know, 5%, 10%, you know, whatever percent of the market share. Because, you know, maybe 85, 90% of customers are, are still going to favor retail, the physical experience. And so you're, so you're, when you go into these new markets, are you the dominant player online in those markets? We're the dominant player online. But in, not, in all four, uh, 40 markets? Well, I mean, certainly the, in some markets there are individual country players who are focusing on depth in their own country. Um, for example, in the USA, FramesDirect.com, you know, it's the biggest US retailer, but they're focusing just on the US market. So obviously they, they're able to build and then their spend, their, their cost of acquiring a customer, they're willing to spend more on acquiring those customers in that competitive landscape because that's what their focus is. But then for me as a retailer, why would I want to compete and spend, let's say, 30 or $50 to acquire a customer in the USA now when I could, for less, acquire a customer in another country? Right? It's still a customer to me. So um, I think we should throw some questions over to Flash you. One more question. Are you building this to sell it to somebody? Is there, do you have, as the you know, finance people like to say, an exit strategy? Or are you just having far too much fun and you're, like, you're in control, who cares? Well, I think that on the subject of fun, you know, we all try to have fun, um, but um, I think the, 
building a business is certainly a very challenging thing, and it's uh, it's very quite painful sometimes when there's a, you know there's a, there's a lot of work, a lot of responsibility that comes with that, um, and um, so you know certainly I'd prefer to be in the tropics, you know, not not working, but um, at the same time. So in MBA translation, like I got this app to translate MBA language. Yes, I might sell my business. <laughs> You, know, you, you build something, okay. so you, 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 you take an you, you interest okay. in building. What, one other thing I realised I'm talking about is that so you, you're actually you've got a nice element like you're giving back to the community. So tell us a little bit about this concept of buy one give one. How does that work? And why did you introduce it? Did you feel guilty? You're like, oh my god, I'm coining it. I better my karma has to be better or something. But very early on, you know, we realised that being located here, we realised what the real cost of glasses is, and the real cost is like it's you know like a dollar or two a piece out of factories in China, and it's it's really disgusting actually that like you know glasses are so cheap, lenses, you know, like frame and lens is like two dollars, right? I'm not talking about branded things here. It's like a simple metal frame. It's really disgusting that like um you know in the world there's probably like 800 million plus people who need glasses. Um, but don't have access to buying glasses, you know. So you've got all these countries in Africa, and the first thing is, you know, you've got to be fed, right? So once, once, you know, food is the basic resource of shelter, but then once, um, you know, people get fed, and then they want to work, right? And you work in the fields, or you can, you know, move into industrialization, you know, like sewing and doing more, um, more fine, you know, things, but then you need glasses. And the access to glasses in these countries is it's just not there, because, in Africa, there's no optometry schools, right? You don't have the university, the infrastructure. It's the same in healthcare, public health as a whole. You know, like um, in terms of like uh, all sorts of public health for like childbirth and you know malnutrition, all these sorts of things. So there's, there are um, organisations like Orbis and Unite the Sight who have um, clinics on the ground in these developing countries, and they're doing eye examinations and they need to provide glasses to um, these poor people, people in need. So it made sense to us, you know, um, if you're going to build a business, we wanted to have some sort of community um, giving back um, part of the business. It made sense that, like, okay, when, when you sell a pair of glasses, you know, let's give a, give, give a pair to someone in need. So at the beginning, it was easier and more efficient to partner with uh, organisations that do that, who have the expertise in providing the glasses. So we've partnered with these and we, we still have very successful relationships with them. So every glass that somebody buys you said you give one? One's a, so how many have you given so far? You know, we, we know that we've given over like one and a half million US dollars worth of glasses. Right, um, so good on you. So good job. Grand, of so. <laughs> Alright, let's, let's open the floor. If you ask a good question, actually, I'll give you a free drink. Can we give them a free drink? Yeah, yeah. You can't ask a question whilst you're yawning, Sean. That's rude. <laughs> Come on, they're here. Come on, they're here. I'll repeat it for you. What elements are needed to enter a new market? How do you do some forecasting and analysis? How do you decide on the pressure? All right, NBA speak. What elements are needed to enter a new market? How do you do forecast and analysis? Well, that was a really boring question. Yeah, it's a pretty boring <laughs> question. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a question. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Well, like, like, I think like, 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 okay. Good mood today. That's... I can see you modeling soon. <laughs> no, no, so you're saying, you know, how do you decide to enter a new market, right? How do you decide to enter a new market? I, I think that um, for all of us with businesses in Hong Kong or interest in business, you know, let's say there's a Hong Kong market, you want to reach out for other markets to go into. Obviously, language is the first thing. If there's a language that you know you're comfortable with, you can do it in the same language. That makes it easy. So from Hong Kong, Singapore, there's there's language, there's proximity to where you're based. You know, because you need to service the market in a shipping. Group. And there's one other thing, which is the shape of the nose, which I learned earlier. Right. Well. As a well, man who speaks on appreciate that beats, right? Gabi so you know, Western Caucasians tend to have high average noses. So, what stage did you transfer? That means you must have a whole totally different range of products depending on the race that you're selling to. There's Asian fit opticals, for like eight, you know, and then there's like normal fit, right? Um, so, like in Asia, we, you know, we, we still list both catalogs, but like. 
the Asian fit models that you you know you just within the, the rules you, you you rank those products more highly because those are the products that are search more highly within the website. So can you answer this question? How do you decide to enter a new market? What what are the elements of it? What's three things. Three things. I think language, location, and then um, the uh, demand. How do you decide the demand? You just look at Google searches. Well, on e and what about you? I, I think from what you told me today, the Hugo Boss guy, Hugo, Hugo Boss, old and squeaky, not moving fast enough. I'll take that. Thank you very much. Yes. No, it's language. Right. Language. Business opportunity. And then you, you know, the slow incumbent. In, in the early days, you know, you, you look at the statistics of how what percentage of the population is online in different countries. The size of the market is it's numerical. It's like these these Google, you know, like Russia. How how big is the internet population of Russia in the USA? You just put them in a list which is the market you want to go into. So then, you know, the right, next question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, that's brilliant. You do an MBA. Do not ask an MBA question. I know that I can't stretch that. That may be challenging. Can you ask it and I'll repeat it? Yeah, okay. Um, you've had the business now for what, eight years. What are the top three lessons you've learned that you would not repeat? Good question. Lessons that I've learned. Three, well, he's had the business for two World Cup cycles. <laughs> what, what are the uh, top three lessons you've learned that you would not repeat? And answer that straight up. As a, yes, straight up. As a settled for uh, business owner, first of all, uh, the most painful lessons I don't mind repeating because they're actually like good lessons, right? So I actually like prefer uh, more painful lessons than you know, not not as nice lessons. Um, and uh, but I, there's not any that jump to mind. But rather, it's like challenges of execution. That like when you are faced by a challenge, not to walk away from. The, the challenge, but to take the challenge head on. Could you give us an example? Such as uh, you know supplier relationships. You know when, when you when you have like a um, you don't have the right supplier relationships, or when you when you, you don't think that you can it's going to work because you don't have the product that you sell. Um, you know find a way around. You know you find find a solution. You know. Okay. There was only one. That was only one. Sorry, she's demanding. There were two more. Painful experiences in running your business. It must be painful because you're, you're, you're in multiple markets, your partners are in different markets, you, there must be plenty of room for miscommunication. I think execution, you know, there's a lot of pain in the execution because you can have an idea, but like actually executing um, successfully is, is a work in progress and it requires continuous effort. So I'm always learning about every day about execution and I'm learning. So what's the biggest mistake you ever made? Smart call buying the name Smart by Glasses. Sure, <laughs> I like Vision Direct anyway. So what was the biggest mistake you ever made? I'm not I'm naturally a positive person, so oh. the negative things are like uh, you know positive. Positive. Coming on stage tonight, yeah. Typical New Zealand answer. He can answer that privately later. I think he's being embarrassed. Yeah. Can I just also ask what? Keeps no, you can't. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. This. Uh, you ask question. I'll repeat. Reverse the question. Huh? What is the best things you did? I don't want to scream. It's kind of a three in one question. Yeah. So number one is what you're doing in Malaysia. Because different countries when it comes to lenses, prescription lenses, different countries have different legal legal issues. Ordinal 359 in Hong Kong says that contact lenses, prescribed contact lenses, it's like you need to be an optician to sell it. So number one, is it even legal? Number two, uh, it's about knowing. Like me, I use AccuView. People always just Asia, we just use actually like forever going to the same shop and everything. So how do you convert me? How do I even know you? Number three, credibility. Your thing, like a Gucci, you are selling online. How do I even know it's not a fake Gucci that you're trying to sell me? Like, if I can get a fake Gucci twenty dollar in the street, why I want to sell some thousand? <laughs> No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> so 
what's, what's her name, please? Say on the chat. Ray. Say on the chat. Well, I think Ray's very astute. She's asking excellent questions. Um, I think I'm going to... Multiple, multiple drinks. I think Ray's going to be very successful one day. Um, looking at the legal aspects of things is very important. And that's, that's another beautiful thing about having a Hong Kong company, is that um, you know, you, you're not localised in all the countries. So um, even though we, we try to comply with all the local laws, like the French laws, because the customer is having making a transaction with a Hong Kong company, because in the terms and conditions, the French customer is transacting with a Hong Kong company, that gives us a little bit of arm's length maneuvering room 